Thank you, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. My name is Chris Fisher. I am a Kentucky boy. I grew up in Kentucky. I fell in love with the water when I was a child. And that passion for the water, along with an entrepreneurial family, I think led me to try to put those two worlds together to make a global impact on the future of the planet. And what was I going to do to make a global impact on the planet? What do we need to do? You know, our oceans are in trouble. We are losing our oceans. And if we lose the ocean, we will lose the planet. And then there will be no place for us to live. So the question was, can we create a social entrepreneurship type of approach for public good? Can we leverage the creative energy of entrepreneurship to break down some of the institutional challenges in exploration, in research, and in education? And if we were going to do that, how were we going to do it? Well. One of the major problems we have in the ocean that's causing its decline is we are losing our sharks. They are the great balance keeper. And in the past, it has been impossible for our brightest scientists in the world to get their hands on full-size mature sharks and let them go alive so we have the capacity to solve the puzzle of their lives. Well, why do we need to solve the puzzle of their lives? Why do we need to know where they breed, where the nursery is? Because they are the balance keepers of the ocean. They are the lion of the ocean. If you remove the sharks from the open ocean, the squid explode like locusts. Wipe out the bait. The game fish have nothing to eat. In the end, the squid cannibalize themselves, and you end up with a dead ocean. Things like you can see in the Sea of Cortez. Why? We are finning our sharks at an unsustainable rate. Up to 200,000 sharks will be finned today. Up to 200,000 sharks will be finned today. And people think they should be afraid of sharks. The reality is they very much need to be afraid of us. And why? For a bowl of soup. Are we really going to trade the future of the planet and the ocean for a bowl of soup? Does that pass the common sense test? I don't think it does. It didn't for me. So how were we going to approach this massive problem and try to save our sharks? Well, number one, it was going to take us all. We were going to have to put together a collaborative, selfless mission, bringing together communities in the past that oftentimes had not collaborated together. World-class fishermen, professional mariners, beside our leading scientists from multiple institutions. And we were going to have to capture these sharks. We were going to have to do things that had never been done. Now, I'm talking about a shark that's 18 feet long and 16 feet around. You can understand why the scientists have never been able to get their hands on them to solve the puzzle of their lives. Not only did we have massive knowledge gaps about their lives, we had public safety issues because they live right on our beaches. I just finished a 34-day expedition off of Cape Cod where the beaches were being shut down, and we didn't know why the sharks were there. We didn't know where they were coming from, where they were going, or what they were doing there. So we brought together world-class fishermen who are literally fishing for the future laying their body parts on the line to deliver them to the brightest scientists in the world so that we could leverage the latest technology to solve the puzzle of their lives. And this was crucial for us to pull off. And I love, I love the imagery that's getting ready to occur here when you see a group of scientists from multiple institutions coming together, preparing to receive a shark from fishermen in a collaborative effort to make an impact on the future of the planet. They, they literally bring the shark back to the ship for, for scientists that are waiting to receive it to do all the things they've n always dreamed of, but never had the capacity to touch a live animal and let it go. I'm talking about our most senior scientists, people who've been studying sharks for 40 years, have never had their hands on a live, mature, great white shark and been able to release it so they could track it. So it was interesting. So here you see the shark being delivered into the cradle on the side of our research vessel. It travels around the world, enabling science communities everywhere. We just finished in Cape Cod. Our next expedition is the Galapagos. Then we head to Brazil next April. And so I started to learn a little bit about the uh, institutional approach to research. I, I helped the first person get their hands on these sharks back in 2007. We just finished our 17th expedition. And we did one research project and put one tag on that shark to solve the puzzle of its migration. The females migrate around for two years from the breeding site, the males every year. Well, it took us 17 minutes to get that one tag on. And I said to him, I said, we need to get some more scientists here. We need to get some other people with expertise. We've got to maximize the leap forward in the 15 minutes we create with these animals. And he said, oh, no, we can't do that because I have to get ahead. You see, my institution, it has to get ahead of the other one so I get the next grant. I said, oh, really? I thought it was about the sharks. 
I thought it was about the ocean. So I said, I'll tell you what, since this is my ship and we're funding this, we are going to invite all the institutions and all the bright men and women with different specialties so we can maximize the leap forward. After all, the entrepreneurial environment I grew up in, my father always used to say, son, oh, you think you're doing good at that. You know what the biggest room in the world is? Do you all know what the biggest room in the world is? Do you know what the biggest room in the world is? The room for improvement. No matter how big. <laughs> No matter how big your company gets, no matter how well you think you're doing, the room for improvement never shrinks. So now we went from executing one research project in 17 minutes to 12 in 15 minutes. And I love the imagery of all of the scientists standing around the sharks. We went from an institutional approach to research to a shark-first, ocean-first approach. It is going to take us all. We have to put institutional and individual agendas behind us. And that led to a number of published papers. We have a handful that are published now from our work that began in 07. We have over 40 research papers being written on our work that we will leverage to affect policy once we identify the breeding site, once we identify the mating site as well as the nurse. We will protect those areas. And that's kind of the short-term plan, right? Pioneer new methods, create new data, and affect change with that new data, but how are we going to affect generational change? That was a whole other challenge. Look, we're leveraging the latest technology. That's an accelerometer, the same thing that's in your phone when you rotate your phone. It's like a black box we put on the sharks. The top tag is a spot tag, it allows the whole world to follow the sharks for five years in real time. We also, we name these sharks, right? We want people to connect to these sharks so they can follow them. So these relationships don't begin just when we, t don't end when we tag these sharks. They just begin. And we try to always come up with names that allow the community to connect with what's going on so they can follow these sharks into the future. Look how much current we got here. So our audio didn't come up on that. This shark is named Catherine. Catherine is named after the woman who wrote America the Beautiful. She was a Cape Cod native. And so uh, the local community could connect with them. So how are we going to make a global impact on the ocean if we affect change and nobody really knows about it? Well, we had to create great scale. So we went to create great scale. How are we going to do that? We were going to leverage the global media. But when we first started this journey, we had to build a global brand, so we leveraged television. We sold 40 hours of television, roughly $20 million worth of TV. I took $10 million and funded the research and the other $10 million to make the show. And that really allowed us to build our pedigree and build our global brand until we no longer needed it. And a year ago, the show was canceled. It was canceled by uh, the History Channel when we lot and I thought, oh, wow, it was the third time I thought I was going to lose my house and the ship. But something really interesting happened. I decided I'm going to scrape together the last of my dough and go to Cape Cod and see if we can't help those scientists up there solve the puzzle of JAWS. But we no longer had to be secretive about what we were doing because it might scoop the series. So we just invited everyone to, to be a part of it. I remember thinking about the Google model of exploration. I was like, we're just going to give it all away. Invite all the media, invite the public, let them witness this because after all, who doesn't have some explorer inside of them? So we did that. And what happened was when the global media told our story, we were now not serving the, ne the network, and we were 100% on mission. And I learned that the white shark works on every content distribution platform. So we started creating the content, giving it away to the media, and we were 10 times bigger through earned media news stories by leveraging the global news as our content distributor than we were when we were on television a handful of hours a year. And not only that, they were asking me for the content. So I was like, oh, that's very interesting. Maybe I should disrupt a little brand as content and integrate the very brands that are funding the research into the content I'm giving to the global news network so that they can distribute it around the world. And suddenly I found a way. I was like, oh, this isn't about ratings anymore. We're 100% on mission. We have found a sustainable approach to generating millions of dollars for field-based research that's 100% on mission by leveraging the global news media, and it just exploded. Everybody wants to tell the white shark story. So as people, more and more people began to follow our work through the media, our social media erupted. 
people wanted to talk to us through the various social media platforms that everyone uses. They, wanted, they started coming to Facebook and asking us questions. They started tweeting and asking us questions. And the next thing we knew, we started to understand that everybody wanted to be on the ship in the now. Everybody lives in the now now. So we went to this full mobile first approach. We went to total inclusion. We open sourced everything and people began to pile on the ship any way they could, asking us questions. We would have scientists answer in real time while we were on expedition. We would, do, um, we would stream right off the ship live and take people's inbound questions on Twitter. And we started to see that, wow, people had never had an opportunity to participate in a research project of this sort of charismatic nature in real time right besides our leading PhDs. The public was solving the life history puzzle of the great white shark besides our PhDs in real time. And that inclusiveness, that inclusiveness, inclusiveness is inspiring. Exclusiveness is not. So we began to become completely inclusive and just give everything away. And then the public started saying, will you come speak to us in person? So we started engaging people publicly. We started going and talking to people, having them down to the ship, school kids. We started going out and talking to people at town meetings. And what was really interesting, because they started to have information they'd never had, this explorer inside of them erupted. Because they were participating in a conversation about why are the sharks off the southeast or what are they doing in the northeast, we began to shift the tone of the conversation about sharks instead of, ah, run, to one of curiosity, one of appreciation for the critical role that they play in the world uh, that we live in. So this was very powerful. Not only were we exploding the body of knowledge forward and leveraging that for policy, we were being totally inclusive and shifting the tone of the conversation. From the community, it rolled right into the classroom. The kids wanted to track the sharks. The kids were so fascinated by the sharks that their teachers were, I would go to these classrooms and the teachers would have invented their own curriculums around tracking the sharks. And I thought to myself, oh, we have to, we have to scale this up. We have to leverage the latest technology. Instead of one classroom, we need to be in every classroom. So I went to uh, look into the educational system and I started to see that there were people making money on educating our kids. And to me, that just seemed, uh, that was disturbing to me. I said, can't we figure out a way to get our Fortune 500 companies to pay for world-class educational tools because they benefit in the end with a better employee? So when I went out and got a full STEM-based curriculum funded and integrated into the real-time tracking of our sharks, so while kids were fascinated with the sharks, they were learning their math, their physics, their geography, their geography. I'm happy to say our new digital hub with our first STEM-based sixth through eighth grade lesson plans launched this fall. Free for the world. Doesn't matter if you're in downtown Chicago or in a boarding school in Vermont. Everyone should have access to a world-class education, and in the end, it serves the very company that funds the research because we're giving them an earned media story they can't buy. We're giving them 3x the value in earned media and a story about pioneering research to create a sustainable future for the planet while we educate our kids, and we started to give it all away. Finally, I said, we've got to open source all the data. Any PhD candidate in the world has access to our data, whether it's in Africa or America, and you can follow all of our sharks on the OSEARCH Global Shark Tracker or at the digital hub right now on your phone. And our kids, while they're following, they're learning everything they need to get a good job in the future. So if you dare, to challenge the institutional approaches to exploration. If you dare to challenge the institutional approach to research and to education, and you simply just put the sharks in the ocean first, always, the children first, always, anything is possible. And with all that we've learned, perhaps the most important thing that will come from this is not only will we you know, have all this new data to affect change now. We'll create generational change by educating our kids. I became loving sharks so much. We can shift the tone of the conversation around sharks if we put the kids and the sharks first. Anything is possible if you do not care who gets the credit. Thanks for having me. I'm Chris Fisher.